Um, good morning and greetings to you from the Huntington Library and Botanical Gardens here in San Marino, California. I am Dewey W. Hall, an English professor at California State Polytechnic University of Pomona. And I'd like to speak to you about a topic titled The Matter of the Lakes, Wordsworth, Hotley Mountains and Weather in 1823. Once upon a time, I had the privilege and opportunity to visit uh, the wonders and splendors of the Lake District, specifically Grasmere, at the Wordsworth Summer Conference. So it's my privilege to be able to talk with you about this idea. As part of aesthetic categories defined in Edmund Burke's inquiry into the ideas of the sublime and beautiful 1757, the picturesque became largely popularized due to three books, Thomas Gray's Journal in the Lake District, 1769, Thomas West's The Guide to the Lakes in Cumberland, Westmoreland, Lancashire, 1778, and William Gilpin's observations relative chiefly to the picturesque 1786. Collectively, these travel records motivated tourism to the Lake District and Peak District during the late 18th and much of the 19th centuries. As one may recall, dear Elizabeth Bennett's elated reaction in Pride and Prejudice when she hears that the tour with her uncle and Aunt Gardner reached the lakes, quote, my dear, dear aunt, she rapturously cried out, what delight, what felicity, you give me fresh life and vigor, lakes, mountains, and rivers shall not be jumbled together in our imaginations, end quote. Jane Austen evidently knew and read Gilpin's observations relative chiefly to picturesque beauty, which she projected into Elizabeth's glowing response. However, unlike Gray, West, and Gilpin, who featured the picturesque in their travelogues, William Wordsworth's a description of the scenery of the lakes, 1823, as part of a series of editions under various titles better known currently as Wordsworth's Guide to the Lakes, 1810, 2022, 20, 2335, and five additional editions from 1842 through 59, separated his work from the literary fashion of aestheticizing the landscape. Rather, Wordsworth's description of the scenery of the lakes reflected a growing preoccupation with the topography in the Lake District and the effects of weather on the terrain, distinguishing his work from other guidebooks, which aligned more closely with Jonathan Otley's A Concise Description of the English Lake District's Mountains in Their Vicinity, 1823. A fellow resident in the Lake District lived in Keswick. Essentially, Wordsworth and Otley described the meteorological phenomena, especially the relationship between mountains and cloud formation and the changes to the topography. Their work is indicative of growing interest in providing quasi-scientific accounts of the region rather than detailing picturesque scenes. Wordsworth letter to Richard Sharp dated April 16, 1822, announced publication of a description of the scenery of the lakes in a postscript, quote, I have in the press the little book on the lakes containing some illustrative remarks on Swiss scenery, end quote. The diminutive reference to the book as little does not suggest false modesty. On the contrary, Wordsworth published this in a pocket-sized version that was meant to be handheld by a traveler, much like a compass or nowadays a smartphone with a navigational application as a guide through the Lake District terrain. That Wordsworth's guidebook did not have any descriptive sketches or illustrations such as Joseph Wilkinson's Select Views in Cumberland, Westmoreland, and Lancashire, 1810, immense in size, represented a fundamental change in the purpose of the book from providing a his history of the location while featuring the picturesque to recording topographical descriptions for use by walkers tracking from valley to valley. Portability was important to Wordsworth and thus the little book on the lake synthesized understanding of natural history and topography with the new science of meteorology in mind. In the fourth edition of Description of the Scenery of the Lakes, dated 1823, inferences are made about future weather conditions. Quote, the country is indeed subject to much bad weather and it has been ascertained that twice as much rain falls here as in many parts of the island. The rain here comes down heartily and is infrequently succeeded by clear, bright weather. Days of unsettled weather with partial showers are very frequent, end quote. 
Wordsworth does not provide a weather chart of the Lake District detailing the number of inches of rainfall annually as naturalist Gilbert White once did in his Natural History of Selborne. A star chart based on natural astrology is not included either, which correlates weather-related plant growth with interplanetary motion. Rather, Wordsworth's assertions about bad weather, bright weather, and unsettled weather reflect weather accounts based on repeated instances of observing weather patterns and predicting meteorological conditions, heavy rain followed by intermittent clear weather or frequent partial showers. Wordsworth's description of the scenery of the lakes observes how the meteorological shapes the topographical. He refers to concerns about erosion on hillsides due to oversaturation from torrential rain, reshaping the topography of the mountains. Carved and etched by persistent rainfall, mountains reflect the atmospheric conditions. Quote, the soil is laid bare by torrents and burstings of water from the sides of mountains in heavy rains, and not infrequently their perpendicular sides are seamed by ravines formed also by rains and torrents, which meeting in angular points and trenches scar the surface with numerous figures such as the letters Y and W, end quote. Here, Wordsworth discerns patterns in the landscape using cartographic techniques to arrive at acute descriptions of the terrain and read etchings, the letters W and Y, to represent rain-carved markings on the mountainside. Deep etchings indicate greater water flow, potential for erosion and modification of the mountain terrain. In addition, Wordsworth discusses the geology of the mountains that are, quote, for the most part composed of stone by what mineralogists term schist, which as you approach the plain country gives place to limestone and freestone, end quote. References to rocks and minerals stem from Wordsworth's association with famed um, geologist Adam Sedgwick, whom he met in the summer of 1823 when Sedgwick visited Rydal Mount while conducting his study in meteorology. Among the quarries in Lake District, the Hodge Close Quarry and the Taberthwaite Valley between Langdale and Coniston has been in operation since the late 18th century where schist and metamorphic rocks such as a green colored slate has been excavated. While the schist has been mined for industrial purposes, Wordsworth sees the rock as a habitat for lichen. This is reminiscent of Wordsworth's Thorn, a poet that describes a stone overgrown with lichens. It stands erect, this aged thorn, no leaves it has, no prickly points. It has a mass of knotted joints, a wretched thing forlorn. It stands erect and like a stone with lichens is it overgrown, like rock or stone it is overgrown with lichens to the very top and hung with heavy tufts of moss, a melancholy crop, end quote. The mountain's surface serves as host to lichens, fungi consisting of blue-green algae. Lichens absorb water and minerals from rain directly from the atmosphere or the moisture on inanimate and animate objects. Since they're rather sensitive to sulfur dioxide in the air, greater abundance of lichens corresponds to lower levels of pollution. The cleaner the air quality, the more lichens will grow. Wordsworth's interest in features of the Lakes District aligns with Otley's concise description of the English lakes dated 1823. The same year, Wordsworth's fourth edition appeared in print and the establishment of the Meteorological Society of London. Otley's guidebook includes appeals to geologists by calling attention to instances of metamorphic rock and the altitude of summits, such as Scaffell, Blackcomb, and Fairfield. While Otley pays homage to West and Gray by quoting their work, Otley, like Wordsworth, attempts to distinguish his work from his predecessors. Otley's preface states a direct counterpoint to previous guidebook writers, quote, but it has been justly remarked that all the numerous works on this subject hitherto published have been written entirely with the view to the picturesque, while other interesting subjects connected with the country have been totally neglected, end quote. Accordingly, Otley is interested in studying the topography. In closing, Wordsworth and Otley recognize that mountains and clouds represent an important interrelationship as part of regulating the temperature of the biome. Without mountains, the climate in the Lake District would be very different. 
where it were states that, quote, such clouds cleaving to their stations or lifting up suddenly their glittering heads from behind rocky barriers are hurrying out of sight with speed of the sharpest edge will often tempt an inhabitant to congratulate himself on belonging to a country of mists and clouds and storms, end quote. Clouds are perpetually cleaving, lifting, glittering, and hurrying as mountains, water, and vapor make up the balance in the bioregion. Otley concurs, quote, mountains have been supposed to attract clouds with which their summits are so frequently enveloped, but it is more to their agency in forming them that the accumulation of clouds in mountainous countries may be attributed, end quote. Otley dispels, dispels a misunderstanding that mountains merely attract clouds. Instead, he asserts the agency of mountains and cloud formation, which explains the meteorological foundation for the accumulation of clouds in mountainous regions. As air circulates, it picks up vapor, water in its gaseous form that then rises when colliding into mountains, which condenses visibly as cloud formation from the collection of water droplets, the dew point. That's all I have to say on this topic. Thank you for your time and attention. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.